Well, good evening, everybody, again. We're so glad you're here. I'm excited about tonight. One, because we get to hang out together, but there's another reason why I'm really excited. Uh, it's because I have two of my other sisters from Missouri in the house tonight with me. It's pretty awesome. I also got my, my buddy Corey in the house, and ladies, he is single. So if uh, you're looking to mingle, Corey might be too. He loved that I did that. Um, we're, I'm so excited that they're here. It's so much fun. There's like, I'm, we're, I'm one of five. And so I have three of my sisters in town and it's so fun. We're going to get to go to Disney tomorrow, which is going to be really cool. Um, yeah, we got some Disney fans and um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And there's only one person that we're missing today. And the one person is my little brother, James. And I actually have a picture of my whole family uh, that I'm going to put up on the screen right here. And this is, this is my family. This is my mom and dad. And this, you know, Coco and Holly and Tiffany are here right now. And there's Kyla and baby Eleanor. And the one person that we're missing is my special little brother, James. And I love James. James is incredible. James, uh, you know, he's, he's just one of those guys who loves life. He loves his family. He's, incre- he's, so, he's like smooth with the ladies. He's always trying to get a girlfriend. You know, it's like he's just really good at stuff. Um, and he, uh, he loves to celebrate life. Everything is celebrated with James. And so much so that when Kyle and I first got pregnant uh, with baby Eleanor, uh, we wanted to do something special because we knew that James would so love it. And so we flew home to Missouri to surprise him and actually recorded a video. And so I want to show you that video today. Boo! James, There's hi. silent stoic face. <laughs> you excited for your surprise? Mm-hmm. Did you bring him a pony? A puppy? Uh, uh, did you bring Junie? <laughs> oh, wait, I just heard a dog. Bauer, if someone are coming here. Oh! Oh, oh. I'm tired. You feel sick? Maybe a little bit. Oh, oh. <laughs> I asked. You just have Alright, James. So, as you know, <clears throat> we came home. Because we love you and miss you. Yep. But also because we have a surprise for you. Okay? So I want you to open it up and see what it is, okay? Okay. 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 Here you go. Okay. Okay. What does it say? What does it say? No, no. You don't know? Here, what does it say? It says best. What does that say? What? What does that say? Best. Best. Uncle. Uncle. Ever. 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 Yeah. Wait. What does that mean? What does that mean, James? What does it say on the back right here? It's not Junie. Whoa. What does it say? It says Uncle James. Uncle James. Uncle Ever? What? Kyla's pregnant. We're having a baby. Oh. What? Yes. What? Yes. What? You joking? No! <laughs> look, look! Look! James, look! Look at this! Oh, this is a picture of a baby! Look at the baby! Look at the baby! Oh! Oh! Yes! I'm happy! I'm happy! Oh. You father! I'm a father! I'm a father! Isn't that crazy? I'm a hot girl! Put your shirt on! Oh, my my We flew home to tell you! <laughs> I'll check my shell! <laughs> Robert! James, how do you feel? I'm a happy! I'm a, I'm a hot girl! Robert! Mom, Daddy, quick parents! Yes! Yes! yes. yes. <laughs> James, put your shirt on! Yes! I'm a grandpa! I'm a grandpa! grandpa! You feel grandpa! You're gonna be an uncle. You're gonna be a dad. I'm gonna be a dad. You're gonna be a mom. I'm gonna be a mom. Where'd he go? He was trying to absorb that way. He really was. He was. He's trying. Oh, 
happy? Are you happy? I'm a cry, I'm a happy. Oh. <laughs> Timmy! Timmy! I'm a hot girl! <laughs> you it! Timmy, you it! <laughs> Man, this baby's gonna have lots of family. I see your auntie. Are <laughs> you so happy? <laughs> yeah. Hey, how are you feeling right now? Happy, and I'm a hot girl. Tell her, uh, a pregnant, and I'm a happy my teacher in law right here. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the best surprise ever? Yeah. So this is my little brother, James. James is also, he can confirm he is the best uncle ever. Uh, he loves his little baby niece, Eleanor, and he's just the best. You know, he lights up our world so much. And one thing that's awesome about James is James uh, FaceTimes me almost every single day. And so I, get, I know I get a FaceTime call from James. I know it's going to be long. Uh, I know he just wants to check in and have a good time. And uh, one thing, I'm like every other brother to a, his little brother. I always want to, maybe you have a little brother in here. You always want to assert your dominance over the little brother. Am I right? Am I right? Um, some of you guys are judging me. You would do it too, all right? And so, um, you know, James and I, we would always wrestle and stuff. And I always want to make sure that he knows that I'm the stronger brother, that I can get him anytime I need to. And so uh, he, he, you know, he kind of always defaults to me. But there was this one time that James bested me. There was this time where I was in college and I was kind of annoying him. We were kind of wrestling and he was done and I was not stopping. And so he told me, he's like, stop it. And I kept going. And so James, what he does, is he cocks his arm back. And then he just goes straight across with all of his force right on my temple, on my ear. And all of a sudden I heard this loud pop and this sharp pain like shoot into my head. And instantly, I didn't know this then, but James had accidentally ruptured an eardrum in my head. And it was one of those things where it was like so painful. I'm like, I was so annoyed. I was like the older brother, totally annoying him. And James loves to, when he FaceTimes me every once in a while, probably like once a week, he'll bring this up. He'll be like, uh, uh, Bobbert, uh, you remember um, I uh, burst your ear eardrum? And I'm like, yes, James, I remember that you did that. I know it. You're strong. I'm sorry for doubting you. And uh, it's, it's, he's very fun. He's, he's, he's so, he always wants to make sure that he knows. He's like, you don't have everything on me. I can, you have got another eardrum, I can burst. So, but here's the thing about my brother James. I don't love my brother James because he has never hurt me. I don't love my brother James because he's never wronged me. I love James because he's my brother. And there's, all, there, there's no, uh, you know, I, I can never, no matter what happens, he will never not be my brother. And this is one of those things where I can't eject out of this relationship because he will, there will always be that familial brotherly bond between us. And what that means is even though we are not perfect, and even though I annoy him, and even though he might annoy me, and even though we might offend each other, that ultimately we are for each other. And my ultimate hope for James is that he would just experience blessing and purpose, and he would experience peace, and that he would experience goodness in his life, that he would find joy and I want to make sure as his brother, I want to show him love. And I want him to know that I love him so much so that anytime he wants, we will make a scene together. Uh, oftentimes, if you guys ever watch Drake and Josh, the one thing that we love to recreate of Drake and Josh is when he goes, hug me, brother. And then we embrace and he jumps and he wraps his legs around me. And he's, and he, he's not light, people, okay? Um, and listen, it is not subtle. Um, you make a scene when you do this with two grown men like this. But listen, I will do that because he's my brother and I love him. And some of you with close siblings may know what this means. Like you go to bat for your siblings, don't you? Like other people can say things about your, like you can, you can kind of joke about your siblings, but as soon as someone else says it, you're like, uh-uh, uh-uh. You protect them. You never give up on them. And no matter how hard it gets, you love your brother. And over the course of the summer, we've been looking at Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 through the end of the chapter. 
And what we've been doing is we've been looking at the marks of a true believer. We've been looking at what the Apostle Paul has written to us. And these, he's saying, if you want to be someone who is identified as following Jesus, if you want to be someone who is different, changed from the world, if you want to be someone who like really following Jesus has impacted you, there's a list of things that should just be falling out of your life. It should be kind of the aroma. And when you go into a room, these are the things that should be made known about you. And the one that I want to talk about today, so, and the Paul says, if you want to be someone really known by your love for Jesus, someone who's transformed by the love of Jesus, then you need to have love and a brotherly affection for each other. It says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. It says, love one another with what? Brother, let's do that one more time. Love one another with what? Brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, love and brotherly affection is interesting. You know, love is kind of like motor oil in a car. You know, motor oil is so important because what happens in a car engine is that you have a bunch of different elements coming up together and they, they're very close and they, and they work really closely together. They rub up against each other and then there's friction. And what motor oil does is it, it enables all these moving parts, even though they're very close together, even though they may bump up in front of each, in a little bit with each other, it actually enables it to keep going and it enables it to keep working and it enables the engine to not blow up. And in the same way, when you enter into a relationship with Jesus, you are given a new identity. You're given a new standing. Your slate is wiped clean and you get this new identity of being a part of the family of God. A new, and you enter into a family you did not know before. And then get this, when you enter into a relationship with Jesus, you enter into this engine of the church and of the body of Christ that all works together and you make up the church. And Paul, what he's doing right here is he is reminding us something. And just like an engine, when you are in with somebody, when you are part of a family, what naturally will happen is that you, will might, you might rub up against someone else and there might be friction happening and you might be working a little bit and just with like our natural sin nature, like we just kind of like, we offend people. We get offended by people. There are certain things that happen that just kind of don't sit well and you may actually hurt somebody intentionally or unintentionally. Even some of the best Christians I know, they cannot opt out of this friction of life and relationship sometime. But what Paul is saying in this passage is he's essentially saying, you need to be like motor oil. In all your relationships, you need to love each other with what? This brotherly affection. Because God says, if you're part of this new family, in my family, I know the way you used to do it, the way you used to interact with people, the way you used to respond, the way you used to deal with things, it used to be different. But in my family, there's a new way of doing things. And when there is friction, I want you to have this brotherly affection for each other. I want you to make it work. I want you to be led by love, not because they deserve it, not because they've never hurt you, but because both of you are part of the family of God and you've been forgiven by Jesus and you've been transformed by Jesus and you've been given a chance after chance after chance with Jesus. And so the expectation now a part of the family of God is you were to do that with everybody else. And you never give up on your brother and this is the only way that the Christian life works, everybody. Sometimes you may think that Christian, the, you know, it's really hard to be a Christian. Honestly, it's, it's kind of simple, but it's super not easy. To let love be the thing that guides you. To love each other with a genuine brotherly affection. So the question is, how do you do this? How do I love with a brotherly affection? Because if you're honest with yourself, there are times where you don't like certain people that you are instructed to love. Have you guys ever felt that? Like there's certain people in your life that may be, in, may be even a follower of Jesus that you're just like, they stink. They are annoying. They hurt me. 
I don't want to love them. They are not fun. How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to show brotherly affection towards this person? And I think what we need to do is we need to, whenever we come across this, this idea of there's someone that we need to love that may be hard to love, we need to remind ourselves of something. We need to remind ourselves that we are in a new family. That when you get adopted by God, you are adopted into a new family. And with a new family comes new expectations. You know, every time a new family is created through marriage, they enter into a set of expectations with each other. That I choose you and no one else for better or worse. This is the expectation for richer or poorer in sickness and in health. These are, these are some of the expectations that you go into when you create a new family together. And every time a family is created, there is a culture that is being set. And every family has its own culture. And every family is cur- currently creating its own culture. And some are good cultures and good things. Some are bad. And if you're like me, it was kind of a little bit of both. There's some good things and some bad things. And God is no different. God has, in his family, has a culture that he wants you to be all about as he adopts you into this new family. And the way he does this is he sets expectations on his children. He says, all right, come on in guys, Here, family meeting, family meeting. This is what we're gonna do. Billy, I know you offended Sally over here, but listen, we're not gonna be like the rest of the other families of this world. We're going to love with a brotherly affection We're going to outdo each other with showing honor to each other. And this idea is so new. It's it's, it's such a different idea from the rest of the world. And this is a different idea than what you and I want to inherently do. You know, um, Barna Research found that practicing Christians are are more than twice as likely to adopt than the general population. And I've had so many friends and family, or so, so many friends and family friends adopt and foster. And it's one of the most beautiful things that you can ever do. And one of my, Jared, who was here a couple weeks ago, who spoke for us, he's currently in the process of, of adopting. And um, one thing that's interesting about uh, fostering and adopting um, is just the complexities of it. And there's difficulties that come with it. And there's so many different things that, that, are, that come with it, with, with all the joy and, and everything like that. But one of the hardships that come along with adopting and fostering someone that may be a little bit older is that you bring somebody in to your house and your home and your expectation and your, and your way of, of handling things and doing things. And they come in bringing their expectation and what they are used to doing. And what happens is there's this culture clash. And, you know, if you're like me, you've, you've had friends and you've heard the stories of just the difficulty of trying to integrate this person into this new family. And they love this person, but they're not getting it at times. But the, the grace that is shown on the parents end to, to give them space, to let them know that no matter what, they love them and they will always love them. But this is the way it's going to be. This is how we deal with conflict in our family. This is how we deal with strife. This is how we talk to each other. It's a culture that is set. And because ultimately these families, they want to see the flourishing of their kids. As you, as you get older and get married and have kids, I just have the one almost two-year-old, but I am struck with how much I just want the best for my, my child, Eleanor. I want her flourishing to be uncapped. I want the goodness to, I want all the goodness in the world to flow to her and there are certain things that we will do in our parenting and the culture that we're trying to create to unlock goodness. And we want to make sure that she responds to things in a way that fits with the culture of our family because we want her, we want the best for her. We want to protect her. We want to, we want to train her up in the way that she should go. We don't want to raise a spoiled brat. We want, to, we want her to respect people. And we, want, we just want good things for her. And when you're part of the family of God, 
you need to be aware of something. When you get saved, it's not just like, you know, what, what's amazing about salvation is you are immediately justified. You're immediately, your standing is made right before Jesus and God, and you have access to God through Jesus, and you're going to go to heaven when you die. But then there's this process of sanctification here on earth, this process of becoming more and more like Jesus. And this is the part where the culture is clashing. You have your flesh and what you normally do and what the world says to do, and this is how you respond to things. This is how you react. And then you have Jesus. Jesus and the new family of Christ over here, and this is how you respond. And it's this idea, it's this clash, and who is going to win? And why is this hard? Because what ha- it's hard because there are people in life, even Christians, that are difficult and hard to love. If we can just be real for a minute, there's ev- the, you you are going to have difficult relationships if you don't already have them. If you've somehow avoided this long, congratulations, that's awesome for you. But there are people in the family of God who may be hard to love. And what God is saying in this passage is not, hey, you need to be best friends with everybody. Hey, you need to make sure you invite them to the wedding. They need to be a maid of honor. They need to be a part of the wedding you know, party. God's not saying anything like that. What God is saying is, love each other with what? A brotherly affection. You know, have you ever heard anyone say, you know, I love God, but I just hate the church. You know, I just love God, but I, I don't like Christians. Um, you know, I hear that, and it's just, you know, it always kind of, kind of sounds, uh, you know, funny. And, you know, I, I believe it grieves the heart of God when, when people say things like that. You know, 1 John 4, 20, it, it says this. It says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For who... Uh, For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. What he's saying, he's like, listen, the love of, if you say that you love God, but you hate the people around you, or you have a group of people that you hate, or you have one person that you despise and that you just want to avoid and never talk to, and and you, you don't want good things for them, then what this passage is saying is that you do not have the love of God in you. You know, someone came up to me and said, man, Rob, I, I, I love you. I think you're awesome. I'll be like, tell me more. What do you mean? Um, but uh, if they said, if they just started like giving me like specific and not like, you know, blowing smoke and just being like being genuine, I would be so grateful. That would be so awesome, you know? And then, but if, if someone, if that person ended the conversation, like, man, Rob, I love you. But dude, I just, I just can't stand your baby girl. Like she's the worst, right? Like Eleanor stinks. I'd be, I'd be like, what? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but like that would, really, that would really hurt my ability to hear you after that point. You know, I, I don't know if I would want to be hanging out with you a ton. Even though you said all these great things to me, if you didn't like my kid, then that's going to change our relationship. That's going to, that, that hurts me. That's not okay. Our relationship will be impacted. And God says, if you love me, but you say you hate one of my other kids, that's not okay. That's not good. You missed it. You don't have the love that I want to give you yet. Because if you are in the family of God, you should have this love of God, and his love is for all of his kids. Even if it's hard to love. He says, my love that I will give you is more powerful than that. And if you are loving people based on this conditional, I will only give them this brotherly affection over this, then I think you are loving people out of your own power rather than loving people out of the power that Jesus gave you when you entered into a relationship with him. So how do you love with the brotherly affection? The second part of the verse is you, you outdo one another in showing honor. And how do you honor? There's a lot of different ways to honor. And tonight, I just want to close with three ways that I think you can honor people that would impact people in in a big way. The first thing that you have to do is you have to go out of your way to honor someone. You can't honor somebody by just always sitting in the sidelines. To honor someone, number one, is to acknowledge them. To acknowledge them. To greet them. To engage them. If you have people in life that you avoid, um, if you have people in your life that you refuse to talk to, or you kind of like turn your head when, when you go, or you see you walk down a different aisle uh, when they come into you, um, 
you not honoring them? Have you ever, ever been in an environment where like nobody really noticed you? Like gone to a place where it's, you know, whatever it may be, and you kind of walked around and you see other people talking and chatting, but no one like ever made like at a point to walk across the room and talk to you? Has, have you guys ever been in a situation like that? Doesn't it stink? Doesn't it like leave like, it's kind of like, I don't think I'm ever coming back there. But on the flip side, if you've ever been in a new situation and you see someone walk across the room and they come engage with you and they acknowledge you and they're with you, that changes everything. That, that's like one of the coolest environments that you can be in. To honor someone is to walk across the room and acknowledge them. My question for you is, who have you acknowledged this week? Who, who have you walked across the room towards this week? Have you done that? To honor someone is to acknowledge. And the second thing that honor is, and that we're going to talk about tonight, is the honor, to honor someone is to seek to understand them. When was the last time that you had like a genuine conversation that kind of breaks through the surface level with somebody? To honor someone by seeking to understand them is to be curious about somebody enough to ask them like the most important questions in life. You know, the most important part about somebody is their spirit and their soul. When was the last time you had a spiritual conversation with somebody? When, when was the last time you asked them like what their background was? What, have you ever like asked anybody like, you know, what was really going on in their life? You know, our mission here at Young Adults is to bring light and life to everybody we come into contact with. And one of the ways we do that is just to en- is try to engage with people and to have a spiritual conversations with people to get, get down to, th- to what it is that you're needing in life, to what it is that God is, gonna, is doing in your life. And people desperately want to be known. And one of the things about the family of God and one of the ways that we can outdo one another in showing honor is to simply get to know somebody, to seek to understand where someone is and where someone has come from. Not in a way to like get anything out of it, but in a way to like, I want to know you because God so knows me and I want to be a conduit of his blessing and his goodness to everyone I come into contact with. You know, uh, I, I remember I was in this uh, season of life where it was like I was going through something really difficult. And, you know, I have, I'm so fortunate to have a lot of great mentors uh, and pastors all across the country. And, um, you know, I, I talked to a bunch of different pastors about the particular problem that I was going through. And a lot of, you know, some of the, they're such incredible men and women. And, um, you know, I, I remember a lot of the conversations that I had, they were like very much like mechanical trying to figure out the, the issue and trying to help me process through it and figure out what I should do and all that stuff, which is really great. But then there was one conversation that I had with our very own Pastor Bruce. I stumbled onto a, a conversation with him and, and I, I talked to him about the problem and he did something that no other person that I talked to did. Pastor Bruce didn't try to offer me a solution or give me a specific advice at that juncture in, in time. What Pastor Bruce did to me so sh- like marked me. He, when I explained what was going on, he looked at me in the eyes and he said, Rob, I'm so sorry that's happening. That must be so hard. Man, are you, how are you doing? Are you okay? And he didn't try to fix the problem right then. What he did is he just tried to like slow down and to see how I was doing. He, he went to seek to understand what I was going through. And I, I remember like, I was like telling something about it. And I started like to tear up a little bit. I'm like, I don't know why that's like making an impact on me. But, but listen, when you seek to understand someone, you impact them in a way that no one else is impacting them right now. Our world is a bunch of surface level conversations. And in the family of Jesus, it's so different. The family of Jesus says to honor people, to outdo each other with honor, to seek to understand them, to see what they're going through to see what they have gone through. To honor someone is to seek to understand them. And the last way that I think we can honor somebody today, to honor someone is to not withhold goodness. 
to not withhold goodness. You know, one muscle that, a, that followers of Jesus need to start working out. And if you're part of the family of Jesus, this is the expectation. This is a family expectation. This is the culture of our family that we have to create and, and go with. We have to have the ability to shake off jealousy and offense and genuinely celebrate the people around us. This is really difficult. Have you guys noticed this? Have you noticed how hard it is to celebrate people who are, you don't particularly like? Have you noticed that? And how many of you guys have noticed even the people that you do like, sometimes when something really good happens for them, in the back of your mind, you're just like, I wish it was me. Oh, they just got engaged. Pfft, must be nice. I just got a brand new car. Good for them. That's awesome. And you could be outwardly celebrating me like, so happy for you. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, how big's the ring? Awesome. Great. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Nope. Still haven't found it. Yep. I'm still looking. Still looking. But as people are part of this new family, we need to shake off the offense, shake off the jealousy, and we need to dig deep and if you are like me, this is, this is a conversation that you'll have with God all the time. God, I'm offended at this person. If I'm being honest, I'm a little bit jealous of this person. But I, I want to I show brotherly affection towards them. I want to outdo each other in showing honor. I want to honor them. Can you help me? Can you please help me? And listen, when you start doing this, it's just like working out when you haven't worked out in a long time. It's weird and awkward and you're, you shake a little bit as you do it. And it's just like not normal. But I promise you that if you keep going back to it and you keep every single day, God, I'm going to throw off the offense. I'm going to throw off the jealousy. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to withhold goodness from this person. I'm not going to withhold a congratulations or, man, we're so happy for you. Or, man, here, man, thank you so much. You did a great job with this presentation. Or whatever it may be. We need to be people who are not withholding goodness. But we need to be people who outdo one another in showing honor to each other. It's, it's difficult because our natural inclination is to not do this. But we have to. In Proverbs 3, verse 27, it says this, um, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is your, in, in your power to help them. This is kind of a, one of those themes throughout the Bible. And the true test of honor is to honor someone you don't like. To honor someone that hurt you. And I think um, we can have this attitude where we write people off and we just think, man, I just don't like them. I'm kind of done with them. You know, that, that person hurt me. I'm just, they don't look at me. I'm done with it. But we, as a part of the new family of Jesus, have a new expectation and a new culture. And we have to change our heart and our attitude to match the attitude in the heart of our Father. And here's how you do this. You combat this by praying for that person's blessing. You combat it and you say, and this is really difficult. This is, this is going to be one of the diff more difficult things that you can do because here's what we think. A lot of times we think that there's just a finite amount of blessing that God is going to give. And if you ask that God would bless that person, then you are taking away from yourself the blessing that he would give you. Have you guys ever thought about that? But listen, here's what we need to know. The blessing that God wants to bestow on all of us is unlimited. God is so wealthy and so rich in blessing. And he wants to shower every single one of his kids with blessing. And by asking God to bless the people who you are mad at, the people who you are jealous about, you are actually doing something that is more towards the heart of God than a lot of other things. This is what being in the family of God is all about. And what if, what if God right now is putting you in a path 
that interacts with all different types of people at school, at work, at church, at the gym, at wherever that you're at. What if God is putting you there for a specific reason and a specific purpose to bless that person through you, your obedience to honor them? What if that was the case? What if every environment that you walked into, you said, okay, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look to see who I can bless with this brotherly affection. I'm gonna look to see how can I honor this person over here? How can I get, how can I acknowledge them? I need to walk across the room. Can I, is there anything I can do to talk to this person to let them know that I, I appreciate them because God appreciates them and I'm changed by God and I want to do something that would totally impact their life because God has impacted my life and my new family set standard is one of blessing and love and honor. What if God was going to use you to do that to the people in your life? but you missed it because you didn't totally understand the culture of our new family. You know, uh, one person who gets this really well is my little brother James, who we just talked about. And my little brother James has taught our whole family about what it means to love with this genuine affection and what it means to honor one another. You saw a little glimpse of it in the video. And, you know, I've had discussions with people um, about James, and, you know, in, he, we've talked, you know, when we get to heaven, you know, there's, what's great about heaven is that we don't have any deficiencies anymore, and, like, you know, if there's any sort of thing that was wrong here on earth, it's going to be made right in heaven, and people have asked me, like, what, what about James? Like, is there, is, what, how is he going to, what is he going to be like in heaven? Is he going to be like more like us? And I thought about that for a while. And I actually don't think James is going to be more like us. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be a little bit more like James. Because James, he loves with this unabandoned brotherly love for everyone. James celebrates and honors everyone he comes into contact with. And the thing about James is James can do this with anybody. Even like the hardened biker dude with like, literally this happened, with like a leather jacket who like, you know, just gruff and doesn't really respond or do any, you know, he's just kind of his own thing. Um, James, by interacting with that guy, will make that guy be in a puddle on the floor in a second. Why is this? Because James understands inherently this idea about the family of God. He never misses a moment to honor someone. He never misses a moment to celebrate someone. And one thing my family started doing a couple years ago um, is something that started out a little bit awkward, I'm going to be honest. Um, We started doing this thing every birthday that we have. There's a lot, you saw the family, we're big. Um, Every birthday that we have, we go around and we try to honor that person. And we just try to say, we try to say one heartfelt thing that is so, um, that we so appreciate about that person, that we love about that person. And James has dubbed this words. So he's like, we got to do words. We got to do words. And so even, you know, we're there in Missouri and we're here, he'll FaceTime me in. He was like, Bobbert, you need to do words. And he'll just FaceTime me in and I have to like do words over the phone. And, um, it's this one of, and James is like the chief of this whole thing. He like makes it go and we just kind of let him run with it because he's kind of the chief of that whole idea. And he lives this way. And he doesn't go too long without letting you know how much you mean to him. He calls me every day to let me know that he loves me. And he, regale, he regales me with old stories. Like, hey, remember that one time I, I burst your eardrum? That was funny. I love you, brother. Brothers forever, he says all the time. He's like, I love your daughter. I love your daughter. And I'm like, I love her too. You're such a good uncle. And listen, when you do this, when you get this idea of what it means to be part of the family of God, it's one of those things that will change your life. But let me warn you, what, 
when you start to start outdo one another in showing honor, it's going to be awkward at first. It's going to be a muscle that you haven't worked and be like, you're really good at this. And you're going to be like making weird faces and you're like, I'm sorry, I'm just, it's so weird. Um, but listen, this is a muscle that if you follow Jesus that you need to work. And I, I just want to close with this. What if our community got this? What if our community here at Young Adults, what if we nailed this? What if we were a group of people who actually did what Jesus asks us to do here? I believe if we were people who, who loved with a brotherly affection and we honored people like crazy, that this community of young adults would be changed. I genuinely believe that we would see more young adults come here feeling welcomed and feeling wanted and feeling known and feeling celebrated. We would have a community that reflected the heart of God for his people. And I truly believe if we did this and you did this, you would see more of your friends be freed up from their sin to follow Jesus because they're experiencing something they, the world cannot provide. If we did this, this church would never be the same. This group would never be the same. Our, your community would never be the same. And the young adults here in Huntington Beach and surrounding areas would not be the same. Why? It's because we would, we would have been showing the kindness of God. In Romans earlier, it says that it is actually God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And so today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you follow Jesus. I don't know if you're trying to follow Jesus. But I, I just want to talk to the person who is trying to follow Jesus right now. Would you just try to assimilate into the family of God by honoring people? by walking across the room, getting to know them, getting to understand them, getting to know their story? Would you, would you try not withholding good? Would you try to bless people and to celebrate their successes and to, to be all about it? I, I believe, and I've experienced this, your life will be transformed. And for those of you who don't know where you stand with Jesus, can I just say, that one of the reasons that we believe that we should not withhold good from other people is because God did not withhold good from us. And God decided he was going to send Jesus as this ultimate package of goodness to save us from our sin. And he freed us up and all we have to do is to turn and to trust him as our Lord and our Savior. And when you do that, you are made right before God. And you are adopted into the family of God. And all the cool things start. This process of sanctification and transformation will be all about your life. And it is the most amazing, hard, awesome journey ever. But God wants to transform you. And if you're here today and you, you don't know for sure if you are a part of the family of God, today you can make that church. You can actually like leave here with an assurance knowing that you are a part of this new family. And so if that's you today, if you just, would you mind just bowing your head with me? If everyone just could bow their head and close their eyes and maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Could you, could you just say, God, I want to be a part of your family. I know that I've sinned. Would you forgive me, Lord? I want this transformational life that you're talking about. God, I turn from my sin and I trust you as my Lord and my Savior. Give me this love, this brotherly love, and transform my life. If you prayed that prayer today, welcome to the family. It's the most important thing you will ever do. And it is the foundational piece in which all of the other things that we ever talk about is laid upon. And if that's you, if you've done that today, man, just grab that connection card that you have in your seat. And on there, you can just say, I want more information about salvation and following Jesus. And just hand it over to, to Rachel or myself right after the service. And we'd love to come alongside of you to show you what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, it's our hope for you today, if you're here and you follow Jesus, that we would be a people who